Sure, go ahead. Well, nobody, I'll just hold the seat until I start talking and then nobody will come and take it. <laughs> wow, that was impressive. <laughs> So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Herndon. I'm the University Archivist here at the Queen's University Library. It's my great honor to welcome you to the 37th Annual Archives Lecture. To begin with, let us acknowledge that Queen's is situated on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to live, learn, and play on these lands. To acknowledge its traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, one predating the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for the indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. The Kingston indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community and there are first people from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. So as you may imagine, there is a long ar archival tradition at Queen's University. The university received its first record, an archival record in 1869. This is a, an order book from Fort Niagara containing the garrison orders and proceedings for the US garrison at Fort Niagara during the War of 1812. And holdings now comprise over 10 kilometers of textual records and two million photographs tens of thousands of architectural plans and drawings, and thousands of sound recordings and moving images. And as a result, not only does Queen's University have one of the most representative sets of its own institutional records for a Canadian university, but it also serves as the primary regional archival repository for southeastern Ontario, with key strengths in areas such as literature, politics, architecture, business, and civic and regional organizations. In the fall of every year since 1983, the Queen's University Archives has held its annual archives lecture, which is meant to highlight the archival collections that are held by the university and to serve as a public forum to disseminate and discuss the research that, ha that is or has been carried out using these collections. Our 2019 lecturer is Dr. Laura Murray, a professor of English and Cultural Studies at Queen's University. She completed her BA in English at Queen's University and her MA and PhD in English at Columbia University, where her dissertation was Going Native, Becoming American, Colonialism, Identity, and American Writing, 1760 to 1820. She is the author of several books and many refereed book chapters and journal articles. Her research career has been diverse from 19th century American literature and newspaper history to copyright policy and theory and to indigenous and treaty history. In all her projects, thinking about the nature and politics of archives has been essential. Her most, most recently, her Swamp Ward and Inner, history, Inner Harbor History Project, which is at swampwardhistory.com, a community history undertaking that has produced podcasts, walking tours, a photography exhibit, many blog articles, and an oral history archive of 75 interviews, both draws from and contributes to the archives. Please join me in welcoming Laura as she discusses her work with communities and records, including those from the University Archives in Counter Archive or Nostalgia, Nostalgia Trip, Reflections on the Swamp Ward and Inner History, the Inner Harbor History Project. It's nice to see you all, um, and uh, it's an honor to be giving this lecture. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be in this room. I did speak here not that long ago uh, with my colleague, Andrew McCartney, and uh, Andra died a few weeks ago. And um, so I'm thinking of her um, because I'm here, and also because she was such a good listener. Um, her scholarship had to do with listening. She was uh, an innovator in the sound walk and uh, in audio documentary. And um, 
I think, I didn't know her for very long, but she made a big impact on me. And uh, one of the reasons is that she had a combination of intense pleasure in listening. Like she really had fun doing it, but also she was really a critical listener. She could do both of those things at once, and I aspire to that. And, um, and I uh, want to dedicate this talk to Andra. So let me just start with a quick review of what motivated the Swamp Warden Inner Harbor History Project, which I can say more smoothly than Ken because it's really a mouthful that I've practiced. Uh, still, I just call it sweep ordinarily. And uh, what motivated it and what its outputs have been. So uh, I started it in 2015. That seems like a long time ago for, for me, but it isn't when I think about it. Um, I started it for a variety of reasons. The first one is that I wanted to learn more about the place I lived. I wanted to make that place more interesting for myself. The second reason is that I wanted to offer an alternative to the emphasis in the way Kingston presents its history uh, on Sir Johnny MacDonald and the 19th century mercantile elites and uh, limestone, I guess, that kind of monolithic uh, branding that Kingston has. I wanted to think a little bit more about uh, people who built these buildings, worked in them, lived in other parts of the city, uh, people who didn't own property, uh, maybe even women, maybe non-white people. Um, I also wanted to think about the 20th century, which I always say it must have happened here because we there's a 19th century and we're in the 21st, it must have happened. A lot of the housing stock in the Swamp Ward area dates to the 19th century, but it's really marked by its 20th century existence. I wanted to learn how to do oral history interviewing. I had done some interviewing, even starting in high school. I interviewed my grandfather, and I trashed the cassette in transcribing it, like you used to have to do. Um, so I don't have the audio of that interview anymore. Um, but I wanted to learn how to do it, so I was able to, to, to study it and uh, to get going on that. I also wanted to um, extend my pedagogical uh, abilities and focus uh, beyond the university. And I wanted to um, experiment with other modes of creative public engagement. And lastly, as I started in on this uh, oral history project, I wanted to resist a prevalent idea that individual stories are just magically produced, that they can be collected or harvested or picked like apples off the tree, um, and the related fantasy that they would somehow magically cohere into a unified story, a unified Kingston story. So this is a page from the Culture Plan of the City of Kingston, 2010. And um, it, it talks about the importance of powerful historical narrative, which it describes as one of Kingston's most compelling cultural assets. And then, you know, I am an English professor. Uh, it uses the passive voice when it says, some of Kingston's many stories are told through, blah, blah, blah. Uh, many of Kingston's stories are also conveyed through, and so on. And, and my really desire was to, to make sure that the subject of the verb was, was getting that status, and to think about who was talking and why they were talking, where they were talking, to make that, uh, to make that visible. Um, so I'll get back to that later. So I think I've had some success in, in the project. Uh, I have, uh, with the help of students and other, other folks, uh, interviewed 79 people. And we've made text summaries of these and uh, uh, time-stamped uh, records so that when they go to the archives, which they will, people will be able to navigate them without listening to all of them from beginning to end. Uh, there have been 56 blog posts on the Swamp Warden Inner Harbor History Project site. I really like the three paragraph essay, it turns out. Um, and I find that it allows for a kind of a combination of information and, and, and kind of artistry. Um, and uh, here you have, because this is about archives, we have a post that is focused around an archival object that was given by a participant in the oral history project, Rosalind Routbard and an archival object that comes from the Queen's archives, tax records, which, uh, as Jennifer McKendry will know, I have no idea how to read. So I ended up reading kind of in the margins, literally in the margins of the tax records. Uh, the project has trained a number of students in oral history, in archival research, and in, in public history, 
Oh, there is a picture of you, Stuart. I told you there wasn't. I apologize. Um, and uh, along the way, I uh, have done uh, public community oral history training, several walking tours, uh, a temporary installation on the lower right there showing the positioning of railway tracks in the Inner Harbor. Heather Holm helped me with that. Francine, I don't know, Francine here, she helped me with that. Francine helped me with that too. It was really fun. There is a photography exhibit we did called Facing the Street, and uh, there's one of the pictures there on John Street with Frank, who lives across the street and who immediately volunteered to look after the picture for the duration of the exhibit. Um, there were podcasts, and uh, most recently I've made an exhibit on the Queen's Archive sponsored uh, Stones Kingston uh, resource that is a kind of profile of 10 families in the Swamp Ward using their photographs that, that, that emerged out of that photography exhibit. And there have been various public presentations about the project. I'm not sure if Sweep is done. I have a list of many interesting loose ends, uh, and there are a lot of ways in which I think that students or colleagues from different disciplines could enrich uh, what is done with what's being collected and, uh, and could augment what is being collected. Uh, of course, as the materials will be donated to the archives, people will be able to use them as springboards for their own research, and I don't have to direct that, so I could just you know, let it loose, get it into the archives. Generally, for now at least, I've moved on to working on other things, on the treaty history of this area and its implications for those who live here today. This research on indigenous and treaty and settler history is motivated by a lot of the same concerns that motivated SWEEP, and it also responds to some of the blind spots of SWEEP with regard to colonialism and race. But I'm thankful for this invitation to give this talk because it forced me to sit down and, and revisit um, the project. Uh, this is my first oral history and public history project. And um, when uh, you do an oral history project, you co-create these records, these documents. And it may be that on the one hand, I might be uh, the best interpreter of this material, and on the other hand, I might be the worst interpreter of this material because you know, I, I'm, I'm in it. Uh, so, so I'm just starting to think about uh, yeah, what, will, what will happen in that way. So of the terms that I chose for starting points for reflection, I'm going to start with nostalgia. And many of you will know that originally nostalgia was considered an illness that could have medical treatment. I think I would say in, in our day and age, nostalgia is understood as a much more positive and even marketable uh, uh, experience. And, uh, it involves sentiment, uh, the sentimental imagining or evocation of a period of the past. So is Sweep a nostalgia trip? Um, I'm a historical researcher, um, and I tend to be suspicious of nostalgia um, as possibly obscuring our access to things that happened in the past. So I kind of wanted the answer to be no, but I think my answer is more complicated. Uh, one reason that I asked the question in the first place is that I've observed that the project, even its popularization of the term swamp ward, um, the old name for the neighborhood, which has really fallen out of use in most cases, um, this, this, this swamp ward term and associated uh, history is candy for real estate agents, and one in particular who sells a lot of houses in my neighborhood. And uh, it just makes me uncomfortable. Okay, so uh, here's the fine print on that house on Raglan Road, and I live on Raglan Road, so I'm really, you know, implicated in this. So in, this, in the text, the ad for this house, we're told that Raglan Road felt like a frontier of sorts. Um, but now, the agent says, some of my favorite people live there. Um, if you buy this house, on its deck you will find a platform to arrange and rearrange the glammy outdoor furniture. You can feel like you won the lottery. You can invite a few dozen of your closest friends, that's a lot of closest friends, I just have to say, <laughs> and survey the changing world. So this is just the discourse of colonialism, right? Just coming in, buying the place, taking it over, and gazing upon it. Um, but it's a mighty popular address these days. And uh, one of the things that makes this house valuable is the dense histories of Belle Island with the woolen mill spinning away to the northeast. Um, it doesn't really matter to sell the house what the histories are. It's just that they're dense. 
so you have something to stand on. What those histories are, are indigenous histories. Bell Island is co-managed by the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs. It's the location of burial sites. It's sacred and very cherished and cared for by indigenous community members. And the woolen mill, well, you already know that I have this thing about subjects and verbs. The woolen mill spinning away. The woolen mill wasn't spinning. It was just standing there. It's a building, right? <laughs> It was the people who were spinning. It was the machines, maybe, who were spinning. And yeah, this makes me uncomfortable, right? Um, but I think, uh, so it, you know, it could be said that sweep has actually promoted a certain kind of nostalgic neo-colonial process in what was and in, in what is now, again, thanks partly to me, being proudly called the swamp word. Um, but it is important to see that this is borrowed nostalgia. It's very different from the nostalgia some people who actually grew up in this place might manifest. Or perhaps we could really say it's appropriated nostalgia. In the process of gentrification, affect is a resource to be extracted. Sean Gregory says, talking about Detroit, the authentic city brand relies on local identity Yet the standardized aesthetics of globalization are disconnected from the local context. Existing physical and social characteristics become the means to replace the existing culture. So it happens everywhere, and maybe I can't do too much about the commodification of nostalgia that may in part draw upon my research. Well, I'm interested for, for your suggestions. What I can do is examine how nostalgia functions in the sweet corpus of interviews. And it is a thing in some of the interviews. So what do project participants miss about the Swamp Ward in the old days? And I am generalizing, there were 79 interviews, there is a fair generational range and so on, so there's, there's, there's you know, definitely a range. But in general, I would say people talk about relationships with, between generations, they talk about class loyalty, neighborhood social and economic self-sufficiency, hard work, being tough, and being known and being safe. So is this missing just sentiment, or worse, is it a distortion of the truth of what happened, which as a historical researcher I would actually like to know? Uh, so here are a few observations. First of all, I feel that I've done enough archival research and historical reading, enough interviews, and had enough interaction with participants that I'm confident that, at least relative to today's Kingston, there is some empirical truth in these claims. People did know each other more. They did own businesses in the area and spend money in the area. They, children did have more autonomy than they do now. I raised my kids there. I can you know, make a comparison and say. So that's the first thing. The second observation is that insofar as project participants may exaggerate some of the positive elements of the neighborhood in the past, we can consider this not only an individual quirk or self-indulgence, but a social phenomenon. Many participants talked about being looked down upon by those south of Princess Street. Thus, when they say they're proud of being from the Swamp Ward, and perhaps they downplay some of the hardships of that place and time, or some of the conflicts and differences within the neighborhood, that comes from an experience, a historical experience, of class uh, and sometimes ethnic or religious stigmatization. So we might see nostalgia not as interference but as historical evidence in itself of a particular geography of class in the city that persists still, at least insofar as it informs living people's attitudes. Nostalgia is often seen as a form of con contamination or obscuring of evidence. As I mentioned earlier, that was kind of my concern about it. You know, in, the, in that kind of way of thinking, facts are hard and in focus, and nostalgia is soft and blurry. Um, we can see this as a kind of a gendered distinction as well. Um, but insofar as people who lived in this place are nostalgic about it, we can actually consider that nostalgia to be information. And I'm just going to play a few little clips from interviews, because that's the best part, really. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, this is Lorraine Snyder. Uh, was born on Markland Street, lived at the corner of Patrick and Raglan for most of her later years. And uh, here's a little bit from her. My father worked at Canadian Locomotive Company for years. And we as kids would quite often walk down with his lunch. Not that he couldn't have taken it in the morning, but we used to walk down with his lunch and he'd meet us at the window and take it, have a chat with us, and we'd walk back again. Eh? 
But, um, and he was a machinist. He used to grind off things for the locomotives and whatnot, eh? And he would maybe bring a little, one of the shavings off that he was shaving. And it would, the steel would all curl like that, eh? Yeah, real sharp edges on it, eh? But he'd like to show it to us. And the yelp and would bring the old belts like from the machines that were worn out, eh? It had to be replaced. He would bring them home and with a bunch of kids. I mean, we didn't have a whole lot, but he used to shoe, put them on our shoes, and yeah, so that we'd have a, a new sole on our shoe when they wore out. Yeah, many a time I watched them doing that. In fact, I think I got an old lath up in the barn up there. <laughs> so, she is nostalgic for this, but she's also giving information about her family and her father's work and their, their circumstances. Uh, here's another person I interviewed, Dennis Crossfield. Dennis, Dennis, are you here? Dennis is not here. Um, okay, here's another brand of nostalgia. The music, the motorcycles, the, the protests, the democracy. It was a magical time in so many ways. Some of the best cars ever produced. Like everything, some of the best everything ever produced. They made it to stay, you know, they made it to last. Um, you know, a lot of that shit's gone downhill since that time, you know. And, and, and you know, people protest and, and they do stuff like that. But we, back then it was unheard of for one thing. So, but this was new. Like, nobody had protested like that before or tried to do the kind of things, start papers and, uh, and, ha and have associations against landlords and uh, go to City Hall and, and actually be, be heard, you know, because you got a bunch of people that they have to listen to. Yeah, like, it was special. That's why I'm talking to you, because uh, I really do believe it was special, and I don't think it's ever been as good since, and I can't see it ever being that. He doesn't finish that sentence. <laughs> he doesn't have a word that is strong enough for that, to, to end it. Um, uh, so, I, I guess I'll just note more could be said, but uh, that Dennis wanted to talk to me because he's nostalgic. So that opened the, the whole gates, and then from then we, we talked to many more people about this particular moment of activism, more than moment, a number of years of activism. Um, so the same people who are nostalgic were often offering information uh, or analysis of uh, various power dynamics in the city. It's not that a person can't be both nostalgic and critical. I, I dare say that's the case with most of us in this room. Um, and um, Svetlana Boim suggests that there are two kinds of nostalgia, restorative and reflective. Restorative nostalgia is uh, make America great again. It's, it's a kind of... Uh, uh, nostalgia that, that aims to uh, recreate something that never existed, he said. And reflective nostalgia is potentially uh, a, a place uh, where, from which one can ref reflect, one can critique, one can, one can imagine um, complexities. I'm just going to play you another uh, clip from each of these people. Uh, here, uh, Lorraine is talking about her husband. He worked at Frontenac Tile. Oh, okay. Out there, yeah for 27 years, yeah. And then um, he had um, that one year, a lot of lifting, eh? And he wasn't the strongest guy, although he worked. N never would miss a day of work, hardly ever missed a day of work. But then they, he was off work and they had to have his back checked out and whatnot, and they, he had a, a, a meningo seal on his spine. So he was left with that. He couldn't do any heavy lifting. And then he went back to work, but couldn't do the heavy lifting, so he had to quit. And it said, they never said thank you. And that time there was no, um, you know, no, what do you call it, at the plant for him to get on. So we were left then with him, no job. And my youngest daughter, she was going to go to grade 11 at KC, and we were, didn't have money, 
So, no, she wasn't going. And that was a downfall because I, oh God, she needs to finish her aid. It weren't very good people, no. And uh, we'll hear again from Dennis. Jim Hutchison, uh, he was a welder in that, and uh, he actually spent uh, time in KP there. He hit a guy, guy went down, died, and he got convicted of manslaughter for five years or something like that. Anyway, he came and got out, and then he, he helped ex cons after that, like they'd get out and he'd get set them up a little bit, as much as he could in that. And he, um, so at a certain point we started this community information service because people couldn't get information about stuff, you know, like how do you get on welfare, how do you, how, what can I do about this landlord, because the landlords were a big deal in the beginning too, especially. Yeah. Um, so we got a little office there in that terrace. Um, and, and Jim was, uh, he was, he manned the phones there for months, um, and he, he was a real smart man, he was. He could, he, the Queen students would come down there, right, and Joan and that, and they just walk and shaking their head. He just could turn them around. It was pretty funny to see, actually, because the smart-ass Queen students uh, would go in there thinking they were going to educate him. Yeah, he'd educate them pretty good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so so one can find different things in the same interview. Um, and uh, then I guess my fourth point about nostalgia um, emerges from the nature of this project that uh, oral historians uh, uh, nurture relationships with people. And... Uh, so, you know, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to build bridges between the, the past and the present. And uh, in a sense, it's a kind of community development impulse. Uh, and, uh, you know, if people uh, should be so lucky as to look at their past through rose-colored glasses, uh, why wouldn't I just feel happy for them? Um, so this is about my relationship with the people that I'm working with. And, um, and of course, people should have the right not to talk about stuff they don't want to talk about, too. Um, and and I'll, I'll get back to, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll talk now a little bit about oral history interviewing and how it works. Um, I think in the end, uh, I would say that nostalgia is a part of the document of human experience, so it's not a barrier. It isn't more of a challenge than all the other affective and narrative complexities of these interviews as documents. Um, because these interviews generate meaning in their contradictions and their gaps and their even in their errors or their myths or their dreams and all these things that's all that's all part of the historical uh, elements um, the primary imperative in oral history interviewing is not asking but listening perversely perhaps an oral history interviewer tries to avoid leaping in and saying uh, wait uh, what happened next or what about that guy or uh, you know why did you do that and um, I admit sometimes I do ask those questions, but uh, I try to honor the principle that part of what's interesting about oral history interviews is what people say or don't say when you don't interrupt them and just keep looking interested. Um, and it, it, it is a different kind of interview than, than some others. And it has its strengths and its weaknesses. But uh, one of its qualities is just this kind of looking interested and waiting to see where, where the person is going to go next. Um, and uh, so what, what do people forget to pursue? How do they swerve from one topic to another? How do their interpretations of the events seem to match the events they talk about? Um, they are signs of such a complex web of elements, including what the person thinks of themselves, uh, what they think of me, uh, whether they're used to being listened to, uh, various kind of you know, ideological frameworks that, that have guided their understanding of their life, and so on and so on. The oral history interview uh, explicitly or implicitly positions a person in time and in relationship and in a broader uh, political and economic history. I mentioned earlier my suspicion of the celebration or fetishization of stories in popular culture of our era. Uh, the city of Kingston isn't the only fan. Uh, NPR and other purveyors of podcasts are big time into this. Uh, StoryCorps, the Moth Radio Hour, and so on. 
Alexander Freund argues that these shows, which package life into three-minute stories of individual triumph over adversity, are the opposite of oral history. With its focus on the individual, Freund writes, the new kind of storytelling tends to atomize society, proposing the narrator as a protagonist who overcomes seemingly personal challenges in a world of inexplicable circumstances, such as poverty, discrimination, and oppression. The rise of storytelling has led to a depoliticization of narrative and public discourse. So these story core type stories, podcast type stories, um, they're particular kinds of stories. They're stories that offer solutions that become managerial tools or self-help strategies they're designed to make people tear up. NPR talks about the driveway moments, right, where you don't get out of your car because you have to wait till you cry, and then you can go in and take your groceries in. Um, and so it's in this context that I don't think of my project as a story collecting enterprise. Rather, as an interviewer, I try to leave room for the threads that connect, the lapses that reveal, and then many different potential reactions and interpretations. It seems to me that in the sweep corpus, in fact, and I don't know how much this is to do with me and how much it is to do with how people talk in real life when they're not being, you know, they don't have a producer, um, that even the most coherent or individualistic narratives offer paths or openings into other lives and perspectives. So I'm going to play you two more clips. Um, these are from my interview with Bob Martin. Some of you will know Bob. Bob the Builder. Um, Bob has done well in his life, and uh, he's got, as you can see from the stained glass installation that he commissioned for his building, um, a pretty optimistic and triumphalist version of history, perhaps, as uh, we could say. Um, and yet, even if this interview is overall the story of, of, of a self-made man, he's telling the story about how he got where he is, um, there's just a lot more to it. So uh, I'll start with the very beginning. Well, it isn't the beginning. He was talking about something else, and then I had to interrupt him and say, oh, we're supposed to begin, because I always <laughs> begin by saying where we are and who we are and so on. So after I do that, I ask our people to introduce themselves and say a little about themselves. Some people will say one sentence, and then, some, you know, then, then there's silence, and I have to think what I'm going to do next. And some people would talk for an hour and a half. Um, that's very rare. But anyway. Bob uh, had a fair amount of momentum, so this is how he starts. Well, my name is Robert Bennett Martin. I was born in 1933 uh, when uh, R.B. Bennett was prime minister. And uh, I, from what I understand, uh, the family was totally arrogant conservatives. And so, uh, now, at the same time, my mother was a Bennett, and uh, they had a grocery store at Baggett and Charles, and we all grew up and worked in the grocery store. And, uh, but, uh, so, you know, my cousins, as well as myself, and uh, uh, we all uh, attended Robert Meek School. We were Protestant, and the reason that uh, we, we could well have been Catholic, but what happened was they, uh, there was a couple, Irish, in Glen Burnie, and uh, it was a mixed Protestant Catholic. And uh, she was Protestant, he was Catholic. He was a real Irishman, and he would bring the produce to town, and the produce would, uh, after he sold it, he'd uh, bring a bottle home with him and get drunk and have a great time, and everything was good. Except that he fell off the wagon and actually hit his head, killed him. Uh, at that point, there were, the children were going to the Catholic uh, school and such. And uh, she brought them all up Protestants. <laughs> That's why I'm a Protestant. And I what? So he starts out uh, giving a kind of account of his name, that it, it comes from the prime minister. But then there's this kind of counter story where it turns out, well, actually, his mother's last name was Bennett. So you know, this, this is maybe possibly, right away, it's unclear what that origin story is. And, um, and then he, he tells, OK, 
that he's a Protestant. And then it's a story, kind of a, a, a fun story for him to tell. He's obviously told it before. Um, and uh, ab about the death of this ancestor of his, who he says is a real Irishman, you know. So there's this kind of st play with the stereotype there. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't explain, you know, he can't get to the subjectivity of the woman in that couple, but there's space for it, right? Because we, we can think, all right, so in real life, you know, what did this mean for this woman? And she decides to become a Protestant again after her husband dies. And um, so it's a really condensed thing. It's hardly a story. Um, and and it, it reflects a certain way that Bob is enjoying to tell that story, but it, there, there's this sort of mixed space for thinking about other experiences or other ways of understanding those experiences. Um, here's another clip um, from, from the interview. Um, oh, I also noticed, because I was listening to these clips a few times today, he says, we all, we all, we all. I just love listening to the way people talk, frankly, so, you know, transcription can never capture this, but we all, we all means uh, Bob and all his cousins, like his family, the Bennett family, who was incidentally like the big family of the Swamp Ward. They owned the big store, okay? So the Bennetts, um, and he, he starts this clip with we all too. But he's talking about somebody else mostly. We all attended Robert Meek School. I like to tell the one story. I, I was in grade eight during the Second World War and Douglas Coda, was a tough kid in the class. He had failed a number of times or whatever, or just didn't pay attention. And, uh, you know, he was smart enough and such, but uh, he was just that kind of a guy, kind of rough. And uh, he actually took after me one time. My mother went, out, went after him with a newspaper, and he never bothered me again, you know, a newspaper hitting him. <laughs> but anyway, this Douglas Coda, we're in grade eight. It was during the Second World War, and the principal's asking, what does her father do? And the kind of things we thought about during the Second World War were things like, uh, you know, spies. We thought about, you know, the Japanese that were brought back, you know, from the coast. We thought about, uh, you know, the kind of things we didn't know exactly what was happening or who was around you or whatever. But anyway, I, I was thinking they were talking about, they wanted to know what your father did, you see, and they were writing it down. And um, they came to Douglas, and Douglas reluctantly said, he drives a garbage truck. And <laughs> Ab says, the principal says, and what, now, now, Douglas, what does your father do? And <laughs> now, at this point, you know, you didn't swear or anything else in school. <laughs> Doug said, he drives a goddamn garbage truck. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Douglas was killed in Korea when he was 19 years old. 1950. His, uh, I, I was a checkout boy at, at uh, Bennett's during the holidays and after school. And, and his dad used to come in and see me and talk about Douglas and, and such. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's upsetting to me, that story about Douglas Coda, um, who, you know, did indeed die in Korea. Um, so it's not a... It's not a story that is kind of neatly tied up, but it offers all sorts of possibilities for thinking about um, the, 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 the different statuses within the, the Swamp Ward. So, you know, Bob Martin calls the principal by his first name, Abe, uh, probably because he knew him later in life as well. Douglas Coda, um, you know, is in a different social position. Um, I don't really... Uh, know what was going on. It's curious though, it makes, me ask, it makes me ask the question why they were asking these kids and you know, perhaps immigrant kids about what their parents did. Um, was this some kind of information collecting um, thing? And uh, so it's got, you know, it's funny, 
the story to, to Bob as he tells it, um, but it's just, it, it just offers so many other thoughts about how that community was working. Um, Bob himself did go to Douglas Cota's grave in Korea and took pictures of it, um, and uh, he tells about that later. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll just leave some of those loose ends in the air. I'm thinking that each interview is a little bit maybe more like an archive than a story. It stores lots of bits and pieces that can be taken in different directions uh, depending on the listener. And uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a double archive too because as Alessandro Portelli says, it's about the past but of the present. So we have uh, today's views and, and a conversation that happened. You know, well, it's doubled again because it's a conversation between two people. Um, and so uh, it, it has uh, all these different uh, dimensions to it. So uh, thinking of it at, uh, of an interview as an archive is, of course, a cue for me to return to my title and the question of the archive and the counter item archive. Uh, we could glance maybe at the definition of the word archive, which is surely one of the shortest definitions in the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, a place in which public records or other important historic documents are kept or a historic record or document so preserved. In university circles, the term archive is also a concept from the thinking of the philosopher Foucault, for whom the archive is a kind of system of knowledge, a system of often unspoken rules that govern what can be thought, uh, institutionalized or mobilized, and how enunciations that already exist can be understood or so mobilized. This theoretical usage of the term is quite different from the definition offered by the OED, but when we think about the authority, allure, architecture, and constraints of physical archive spaces, we might see a connection. The archive is necessarily selective. It's often or even usually controlled by the state or at least other institutions which aspire to solidity and durability. It orders its contents in certain ways that are not easily legible to most people. Its organization may make it unclear what is missing. And it constrains and disciplines researchers who venture into it. Archives place users in a position of obedience and sometimes physical discomfort, as many of you will know. Uh, in fairness, that's what they have to do to protect this stuff. But while I absolutely adore archives, there's always that nervousness about getting scolded or asking too much. Um, when I was working on 19th century newspapers, there are these papers that were called bedsheet newspapers for a reason, because that's about how big they are. Now, in the day, you'd fold them up into little bits and just read them. But when you're reading them in an archive, they're enormous. And I'm short. And like I, I just could not even see these things. And I'd be walking around in all directions and trying to find ways to lean so that I could actually see the thing. Um, so uh, both the physical and the Foucauldian archives are places of constraint. With reference to these definitions, if one speaks of counter-archive, one might be speaking of a different kind of place. Uh, one might be speaking of a different standard of importance uh, or a definition of historical record. Uh, one might even be challenging the primacy of the goal of preservation, which are the key uh, categories as defined there in the OED. Um, so where does Sweep fit into all this? Well, Sweep sort of started by me talking to the guy who lived across the street from me. Um, that's just kind of its prehistory, but it started as a formal project in the archives. The first thing I did was to prepare a walking tour about Bagot Street North as a Jane's Walk in 2015 uh, with a student and uh, a community volunteer. I dug into the Chown papers, for example, and uh, also uh, partly by the Kingston Public Library, city directories, fire insurance maps. And a couple of months of learning gave me something to share with community members. I mean, why would people agree to be interviewed, right? I, I showed, tried to show myself as being somewhat knowledgeable um, and curious. And uh, archival research shared in the place I was studying in an open way started the circle rolling. Um, and uh, it seems that my projects often begin this way with kind of presenting the little I know first in order to, to glean more in this kind of, this kind of process. Um, and this, in turn, gave me access to, to people's personal archives. 
Um, and uh, these, these, the one at the top, though this paper belongs to the people, those are from John Kuyak, they've been donated to the archives. Um, and they, the, this photograph of Hyman's Deli will be donated in digital form. Um, but uh, a lot of the knowledge I got was from things that people had kept. So Sweep was initiated by me, a Queen's professor from Toronto, no less, which was actually a fairly big barrier for some people to really want to talk with me and trust me. Um, and, uh, and not by the community itself, like I started it. And uh, I never considered housing it anywhere other than the Queen's archives. Um, some, you know, some projects, community-based projects might do so. Queen's University staff uh, helped from the outset in um, uh, thinking about my consent forms, my collecting policy. So in many ways, it's a squarely archival project. But are there some counter-archival dimensions to it? Well, I mean, I was making a claim that the archives didn't hold enough images or words by ordinary people. And in that sense, my work had a certain counter-archival energy. It was also a bit counter-archival in that I did quite a few things I intentionally didn't document. Um, and uh, so you saw the, the temporary marking of the train tracks in the park. That was partly temporary because I didn't have a permit for it, but it was partly temporary because grass grows and has to be mowed. And it was really temporary though because I just wanted you have to be there. Um, and, and I also think that sometimes the more um, uh, heavily we plant a plaque into the ground, uh, the less people see it. And uh, so I, I, want, I liked experimenting with that, and that's why I love doing walking tours too. Like, you're there, you're not there. If you're there, it's a kind of a collective experience. There's an opportunity for conversation, and in fact, I found many people to interview from doing walking to, to, um, tours. So I think um, in, in the way that artists sometimes use the word counter-archive, as, uh, as Susan Lord uh, uh, has, has taught me through uh, um, a collection uh, in the journal Public, um, I think that uh, this idea of the temporary, the pleading, the temporary, the transitional um, is, is something a bit counter-archival about my project. But generally, I thought, okay, no, it sits into the archive. That's what I thought until I read, last week, the Queen's Archives mission statement, um, when I became less comfortable with my relationship to the archives. <laughs> so you probably can't read that from there. I will read it to you. Uh, Queen's University Archives undertakes its activities in order to manage, preserve, conserve, and make accessible the information assets of the university, to maintain an authentic record of the programs, people, and operations of the university, to provide archival management and conservation for culturally significant records of external organizations and individuals in support of the teaching, research, service, and administration interests of Queen's University. It's a mission statement and then there's various values below it. For example, offering efficient, equal, and exemplary service to stakeholders, um, stuff like that. Uh, I, I really have problems with this as a mission statement that is on the website, that is the thing people see when they think, oh, what's the Queen's Archive? Should I go there? Um, I don't think it actually matches what the archives does what it is already doing, um, where, you know, on any given day when I go in there, a lot of the people in the archives are not from Queens, um, and they're researching things that may or may not have anything to do with Queens. Um, and uh, I also think it, it falls hugely short of what the Queens archives could do. So, of course, it's important to be efficient, equal, and so on. Um, but you know, those are baselines for customer service, okay? I'm, I'm good with that. But what about generosity? What about curiosity? What about responsibility? Um, how would this mission statement strike a person wondering whether the archives might be interested in their family materials or their community organization materials? Uh, how would they know if they would be welcome there if they walked in the door and they had no affiliation uh, with the university? Only the Queen's connected or otherwise entitled would be likely to pick up the phone, I think, from that statement. So I looked at a few other examples. Uh, McMaster has a, a statement pretty similar to Queen's's, but there's a city archives in Hamilton. So they, there is another place where uh, information outs, you know, that isn't part of the university can go. And that's just not the case here, and I don't know. I'm not an archivist, and I... I really, I didn't want to, I haven't talked with, with Heather and, and Ken about this, but um, be, 
we, we are the only archives in town, so you know, that, that becomes a, a broader mandate sort of by default, I suppose. And I don't know how typical or atypical that is in a smallish city like ours. Um, so here's the mission statement of the archives of the Brooklyn Historical Society. Much bigger city, more money, and all that kind of thing. But still, it's just much more inspiring. Um, we serve the mission of the larger Brooklyn Historical Society to connect the past to the present, I like that one, and make the vibrant history of Brooklyn tangible, relevant, and meaningful for today's diverse communities and for generations to come. And they talk about collecting, preserving, and promoting access to our library and archival materials. So, you know, it is a different scale of, a, of an organization, but I do think that Queen's has a lot of untapped resources in its staff, in its faculty, in its students, and in its community. And we do have more uh, opportunity to be more welcoming, both to users and to donors uh, for the archives. And I'll close with a, with a word to the librarians in the room. Um, and I, I was thinking about the term open access and uh, back in my copyright days, I spent a lot of time thinking about this term. And uh, of course, it's, it's a term that is used in the noble fight against profit taking in the academic journal industry. Um, it's definitely not appropriate to allow price gouging for access to research, and it's great that alternatives are being developed, open access alternatives. But some people have asked, are open access publications actually accessible? True accessibility, and here I'm inspired by the disability rights movement, doesn't just have to do with lack of barriers. It has to do with real openness to hearing the needs and ideas of those who otherwise might be excluded and generating the resources they need with their participation. At this library, the last time I checked, if you don't have a Queen's user ID, you can't look up anything in the catalog. You can if you think to go to the main counter and ask for some kind of an override, but if you try to get access to any of the computers, you won't get in unless you have a Queen's user ID. Um, to have an open access library and archives here at Queen's, which you know, I think we should aim for, uh, to, to some extent, we should go somewhere in that direction. We have to welcome people, not just unlock the door. We don't need a red carpet, but we need to send an invitation and not expect an RSVP. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll close and I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, I can conduct my own questions. I guess I'm not supposed to move around too much though, so I'm gonna move back here. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, any questions from anybody? Oh, and they're supposed to be, you're supposed to use a microphone. Heather has a question. Just in, I think it's on, yes it's on. Um, what you were talking about, this sort of story idea, right? These ideas of stories versus and, and the selling of those stories. Because I see a lot of that as a counter argument to big data and datafication of people, right? And so what that is coming, and maybe sort of in what you're, you're saying, that there, it's maybe swung too far the other way, like from people be, just being, you know, quantifiable through data uh, to these individual stories, which, you know, aren't necessarily, are hit, you know, the podcasts, the whatever, that are just hitting, I don't know, uh, tropes of some kind of uh, emotional uh, sphere that we're hoping to get at. But that, that's where I see those stories coming out of and whether or not there's some kind of happy medium in mm -hmm. between that sort of people as data <laughs> or, or the, the quantification of self and, and actual stories. Well, more complicated stories, <laughs> I suppose, and more of them, uh, you know, because really uh, what those shows do, and you know, I enjoy them myself sometimes, but I've just lost tolerance for a lot of that, um, because it's all too predictable, because the stories are really these, these stories of, 
individual kind of triumph. And um, so, you know, as a as, so as a as an English professor, um, you know, I think that story doesn't have to be reduced to such a caricature of the word story, um, but that is the kind of pop culture use of the word. Um, and it often gets confused, oral history often gets confused with that kind of storytelling. And I think that's in Alexander Freund's article, that's sort of something he's trying to, trying to, uh, to, to resist, that, that conflation. Um, but I guess we need better ways of talking about collective experience that are not data. And uh, that can be done through words and you know, other kinds of research and through uh, combinations of individual experiences and, and collections and relationships, I suppose. Yeah. I think that's a, yeah, it is that, how do you uh, sort of show the collective, you know, like again, not even quantification of self and all of that data is very much about individuals, right? And about looking at societies which generate individuals and which people interact with or fight up against or whatever it is and how do you, how to get that out there sort of through archival I always think of it through archival material but like that's not data and that's not individual stories where do you then find that well the other thing is that in these interviews people as you've heard often talk about other people so they are not uh, in fact I was disappointed at first that people didn't seem to want to tell me their innermost stuff. <laughs> and uh, there are various reasons for that. Some, some of it is about the framing of the project as a neighborhood history project. So people were thinking about their, their experience in that place and their knowledge of other people in that place. Um, but, but also I think that that's what that they were interested in when they were thinking about their memories as other people a lot of the time. And um, so there was a kind of a social impulse in the way I, I felt people approached those interviews. Uh, it was not, they, they didn't necessarily think, oh, this is autobiography. Uh, I have to think a little bit more about how much of that came from them and how much of them came from the project. But. Question back here. Thank you. Uh, did you track down the origin of the Swamp Ward nickname? Um, hmm, let me think. Um, <laughs> well, there, there would be different explanations about that. I mean, partly it's just, it was just really swampy. Um, it was really wet um, because the, there were, there were uh, marshes and uh, not a hard boundary between water and land in the early days. And in fact, you know, all of, as, as you may know, all of, of what's now Fleur Park was, was water. And there were, there were uh, as Stuart has told me, uh, many marshes in the, in the whole area. So some of it's that. Um, and it was probably pejorative from the get-go, but then the people who lived there uh, took it up, you know, and, and, and inhabited that term in another way. Um, as it turns out, uh, the, the word Gadaraqui, which is the indigenous word for this part of the world, also has to do with swamps. And um, so uh, we, don't, we don't really think of it as a big wetland town, but you know the history of Bell Park and how it was a, a wetland and then it became a dump. So we've kind of, a lot of those swamps just aren't around us anymore. If it was in Paris, it would be called Le Marais, and it would be just like the hottest place ever. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, just wanted to mention very quickly uh, that the Swamp Ward term goes back a long time. Yeah, it goes. I didn't look it up, but I think back at the 1870s. You did look it up. Though. Yeah, you found, you found a mention yeah. of it in the 1870s, 1870s with a baseball team or something. That's right. Uh, the, the question I did have concerning the oral histories is because um, one has to make an assumption about the truth of what's being said, or the lack of truth, or the way truth is changed through recalled memory. And if you're talking especially about a third party, is there any problem in something that could be considered derogatory about a third party appearing in these oral histories? And I'm thinking, for example, um, in the house I live in, which is in Portsmouth, 
uh, one of the persons who lived there a very long time ago came and visited me. And she mentioned that part of what happened there was a child being beaten. So I only have her word for it. The way she spoke, it sounded true. But I don't really want to record that mm -hmm. in any kind of archival way because I have no proof of it. And it would reflect back on the people that she's talking about. Yeah, that's a very good question, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a complicated one. Um, I felt that a lot of the people I've talked with kind of self-censored in various ways, um, had a sense of what they thought was when it was proper to name people and when it wasn't. But of course, people have different boundaries about that. Um, one person I interviewed was uh, concerned enough afterwards to want to have some bits of the interview taken out. Um, and interestingly, it, that was not a story that I perceived to be controversial or insulting, um, but, but they did. So, you know, it had to, that had, decision had to rest with them. Um, in oral history uh, collections in general, it's not the practice to, to, to take such moments out um, unless the person you're interviewing wants them taken out. Um, and I don't know whether, you know, what the legal um, concerns are there. Um, but, as you said, uh, it's one person's word, so it might be an upsetting allegation, but it isn't making the claim that this is indeed the truth, and uh, so I guess that's where it stands. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I, you know, the, the story about Douglas Coda, I, was, I feel, uh, you know, complicated feeling about playing that story, Douglas is not alive anymore. Um, the reason why I think I can play it is that, to me, uh, he doesn't come across as a fool. You know, there's, there's enough in there that I can see him as a complex human being um, beyond whatever that moment uh, may, you know, may come across as. But I think a lot about these things. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for this. Is this hot? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you to, to uh, explain a little bit more about your process and especially, I know it's an oral history process and you've shared with us the discipline that surrounds that and it's just fascinating. Um, but you also uh, have touched on the role of Queen's Archives and the archive uh, in the world. Did you, were you pursuing also uh, records, photographs? I, I know you shared some photographs really inspiring ones, and I'm so interested myself in material history. Were you gathering, did you see a role for yourself in generating this history as gathering more than these oral accounts? How, how did that relationship play out with the people you interviewed? Uh, it, it probably could have been more proactively discussed and arranged before the project started. Um, I mean, Paul Banfield, who was then the the archivist, he gave me a pile of his cards and he said, you know, if you ever want to like tell people they can give stuff to us, you can. Um, but I don't work for the archives. And um, I also was in a bit of a kind of a conflict in the sense that, you know, so one of those pictures was um, Isabel Wallace Gordon looking over her photo albums. I don't want to like grab photo albums out of people's hands or out of their children's hands or whatever. I mean, people have their own plans for these things. So I certainly you know, showed my interest in them. And in some cases, when I was working with Chris Miner on the photo exhibit, we did high quality digitization of quite a lot of materials. Um, but uh, you know, I think, and some of this isn't too late to consider now, but it, it probably would have been good if I and or in my relationship with the ar archives was kind of clear. I don't think that I would have, in the first instance, wanted to be a collector or a or a representative of the archives. It would put you in a different relationship. It would, yeah. Um, but I do, I, I have seen a lot of material that I think is of greater value, you know, um, it, it, that, that illuminates quite a bit about the history of the place. And I think that there are some people, you know, we, we've, we've all been in this situation, some people whose kids may not want all their stuff. Um, and also some people who may not have thought that anybody would be interested. And so uh, there's, there's, there's possibilities there. It's a little in the air, I guess. Thank you. 
Thank you, Laura, for this. Uh, I come to the archives from a bit of a different uh, position, which is from the world of model railways. And, some, and I contacted you once about this, or people call it toy trains, but as we know, it's actually a basement transportation system in scale. <laughs> so it's sort of like looking at archives versus oral history. It's uh, how you look at it. But in doing that, I've been modeling Kingston. The, the track's about that wide. And it's very difficult to find information on uh, industries, let's say. It's very easy, when you said north of Princess, I thought it's very in easy to find pictures of houses south of Princess and the history of families. And it's been done very well over the years, but to find that, let's say north of Princess, is a bit more challenging. And so, by going to the archives, and they welcome me, I mean, they're very good. They did make me wear those little gloves, those uh, silk gloves, which I don't really like, but I get it, because you're touching negatives. But I found it very easy to, at this point, go through some of the week standard photographs, or photographers' photographs, and to see some of that as it happened, and to find that. But what I do find, it's just a comment, and maybe what, what you tried to answer some of that, is to find what exactly happened at Canadian Locomotive Company, what exactly happened at the woolen mill. And, and that is really what interests me when I'm building a model. Okay, it's a model, but what actually happened there? And there was people that actually were in that actual building. And uh, that's sort of maybe a more social history that I'm in interested in, but one thing I did have some fun with is trying to find the, the ideal swamp board house. And being lazy and not going on a walking tour, of course I went to Google Earth, and I walked virtually around all the streets of the swamp board, and I was actually able to make an amalgam of a swamp board house. And it's kind of a distinctive thing. Some are brick and some are stone. But it's very different north of Princess and in Swampward from what someone as a layman like me finds south of Princess. Just an observation. That's so. intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, to me, one thing that characterizes the, 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 the neighborhood is the variety of uh, housing materials and placements on the lots and so on. And, um, in the North Kingstown planning process, this is one of the things that's being discussed. Is it's not so much the individual houses, but their their combination and their placement that characterize the neighborhood. Uh, as for life at the Willen Miller Canadian Locomotive, Canadian Locomotive is the wrong side of Princess Street for me. I don't go there. Um, but the Willen Mill, I have interviewed some people who worked there, and Bruce Warmington wrote a book about it. It doesn't have a lot of the sort of the texture of people who work there, um, and you might have to look then at other Willen Mills and and that kind of thing. Um, I also, uh, a lot of the memories, a lot of the information or memories, whatever we will categorize them, about those industrial spaces that I have come from people remembering them from their childhoods, right? Because this is where we are in, you know, in 2019. So people have very vivid childhood memories of either their parents' work or um, going as children down to the industrial areas. So necessarily then that's, that's missing various dimensions. Um, there are a very small number of documents that I know of that are memoirs that have been written by people in the area, um, but there might be more. You know, again, uh, it's possible that uh, if there was some kind of a, a call or, or, or a plan, um, it, people would have more kinds of, of uh, materials that they could share. Mindful of the, be mindful of the time. We do have refreshments and an opportunity for further uh, discussion now. So first of all, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues in the archives, particularly Heather Holm and Lisa Gervais for all their work around organizing an event like this. There's always all sorts of things that go on behind the scenes to make it happen. The support of the Office of the Vice Provost and University Librarian, uh, Nancy Petrie, uh, Emily Zhu, Joseph Lee, um, and all our colleagues there. And I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Laura for sharing uh, her research with us and uh, challenging us to think about the nature of narrative, of story, and of course, of the archives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.